And I'm very pleased to um, introduce Jay Sam. Um, I have wanted to present, um, have a presentation by the Little River Band or the Grand Traverse Band for quite a while um, to open up our minds a little bit about um, our local culture. And it goes beyond when our county was founded 150 years ago. And um, Jay is a delightful um, person to speak with. He encourages you and really hopes to get a lot of questions and to have a good conversation with you. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of his background. He has served in a variety of posts and roles and he has served as a court judge, um, court judge Omega, which maybe he can explain what Omega means in, in the system there. He's currently the Director of Historic Preservation Department and the Operations Lead for the Little River Band. And welcome, Jay. Um, thank you. Could you uh, allow me to share my screen so I can? There you go. It's up here, so it looks nice. There you go. This is our tribal flag. I use it as a pacekeeper till I get started here. And I want to say hello. So I will. Buju, Ninwak, Kwewak, Mikizi Inabendamaki and Disnakas, Gachin Zibi Dawa Nishnabe and Dojaba, Namanitagang and Dot, Nimkidin Dodam, Nus Disnakas Abayankat, Chinus Disnakas. Makwa Maskwa Ankwa. We do these formal introductions, and what, what it is is it's your name. Mine in the language is ego who sees the world and he, as a dream or dreams and sees the world. Then I tell you that I'm from the Little River oh, Band of Ottawa. And then there's the uh, information that in includes where I live, the land under the trees, Namanitagang and Dot. Screen. And. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and and then I said that I was a Nimkid clan member. And those are formal introductions. I told you my father's name in the language was clouds gathering together, and that his father's name was clouds colored red. You do all that because we don't have a last name. We only have our name. And so you have to kind of let people know where you're from, who your family is, so they know who can identify who you are. Um, that's a for way to formally introduce. The way to not formally introduce would be to say Ani, which is like hi, and then just say basically Anishna and uh, which is how you doing? I am a uh, going to now give you a brief explanation of my name, last name, Sam. My great, great grandfather was named Pakadosh. And before he was called Pakadosh, he was called Kagigigayabo. I don't know why he changed his name to Pakadosh, but when he was running for it, village, that's his name. His son was named Benise which is a great gold eagle. He also was given a, an English name, William Pakadosh. I should say Pakadosh also had a little sir, uh, they called him Pakadosh, but they always called him Sam because they couldn't say Pakadosh and you can't spell it. <laughs> so William became William Pakadosh with Sam in parentheses. His son, George, my grandfather, became Umasqua Anquat, became George Sam, again with Pakadosh in parentheses. By the time I got to my father, whose name was Johnny J. Sam, the same as mine, they just titled him Johnny J. Sam and took the Pakadosh part off. And suddenly our last name became Sam. Mm. So that's how we got our name. The interesting tie in here will be 
when Europeans first met with the Anishinaabeg, there was a, a formal council so that we could decide whether or not we were going to stay friends and they could decide whether or not they were going to be friendly. And people in the council were talking about the, the topics and they had a couple of um, interpreters there who said they spoke Anishinaabe the language of the Anishinaabe. And as the council was going on, and for those who are not tribal, this may not seem funny, but it's funny to all the tribal folks. The council meetings usually went four days. Today, they don't go four days, they just feel like it. Anyway, as they were in the council, they had permission to have somebody standing off to the side asking questions and getting answers. During the council meeting, young men would come in and put wood on all the fires and they would tend the lodges that were near in the village they were in. And the guy wanted to know since they weren't dressed as the people in the regular council were, he wanted to know who they were. But instead of asking who they were, he asked, what are they doing? Because one word is Wenesh and one word is Wegnesh. And when he asked, what are they doing? He was told, Bodwayadaman, Bodwayadami, they're tending the fires. And so he wrote down that those people were the Potawatomi. Later, he saw guys getting the canoes ready, the big Chimon, which I'll talk about later, and, and going out and trade to trade. And he asked the same question, and he got told, Dawa Nini, the trading men. So he wrote down Dawa, which became Dawa, Odawa, Ottawa, Adawa. There's lots of them. And in the end, as the meeting went on, another group of people came running in and talked to others and exchanged information. And then they took off after having a brief meal and some drink. And the same thing happened. Instead of asking, well, who are those guys? He asked, well, what are those guys doing? And he was told, Ajibwe. They're bringing them story. They're telling the news. 500 years later, the Anishinaabek, that's the people of all those villages, are now known as the Potawatomi, the Ottawa, and the Chippewa, which for some of the older, more traditional folks gave a good laugh because they said, those who are Potawatomi have to travel the whole state to make sure everybody's fires and buildings are okay for the lodges because they're the keepers of that. The Chippewa have to travel the whole state to bring everybody the news and to make sure everybody's got the, 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 the traditional stuff, the spiritual stuff figured out. He says in the Ottawa only have to travel wherever they're going to go trade. I think they got the best deal. But those are two examples of how names become important. And now I have a question. This, of course, is a well, it's one of the more accurate, actually, pictures, as you can see from underneath, of Custer's Last Stand by Paxton. And here's my question. How many people survived Custer's Last Stand? Can't hear it. Thousands. Okay. Most of the Native Americans did, right? All right. See, this is why I bring this up. When I go into colleges and schools, and I ask the same question, the answer is always zero. And that's because those folks only see this group of, as they say, armed invaders and destroyers of land as the people. They never identify any of the folks out here, of which thousands did survive as people and that identifies a point of view all histories are told from a point of view i say this so i can warn you that the history i have was told to me by people whose point of view was probably a little different 
than people who wrote most of the books and did all the, the things of that nature. I'm also going to give you, as I mentioned earlier to in our discussion earlier, two quotes I, I love to, to use when I do this. They're about history all by itself. First of the quotes is from Adolf Hitler. Probably shouldn't quote Adolf Hitler too much, but in this case, he was asked, what will history record about the Nazis? And his response was, history is always written by the winners. And I don't intend to lose. The other one is the quote from Napoleon, which was translated in several different ways. The most brutal way it's translated is history are the lies we all agree to. All the history is always told from one point of view or the other. It's very seldom told as an overall view. With that in mind, we're going to start moving forward. Excuse me, Jay. Yes. I've had a couple people ask if you could show yourself occasionally. They'd like to see you speak if you wouldn't mind. Uh, well, can I don't mind. Can you bounce mind. back I... and forth a little bit? I, I can say that I do not mind. I'm Wonderful. pretty sure they might. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I always felt it was a, a better look for me not to be seen that much. <laughs> I, I have the true face. I think you've got a wonderful idea. smile, so I think we'd love to see it. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this so I don't. I think you just unshare for a moment. Okay. But I don't want to make it difficult for you either. And a reminder to everybody to um, mute. I'm getting some feedback from some folks that it seems a little scratchy. Okay, this is the this picture is one of them I used to show the discussion of how we got where we are. Most Anishinaabeg tribes and most Indian tribes in North America, or however you want to call call them, First Nations have creation stories that put them here in, Nor in what is now North America and called by what they called it. This is the picture that comes with our story of creation that includes the flood, which was created when Nanabuju, that's Nanabuju right here, I don't know if you can see the arrow moving, killed the underwater serpent who was the master of the underwaters because the underwater serpent had um, killed his friend, the great wolf, known as, um, oops, let's see, I screwed it up. Known as Mahangun, Chi Mahangun Makwa, the, the big wolf that's black. Because wolves live beside us, that we weren't. There were no big bad wolves in any of our stories. Wolves didn't hurt humans. Wolves, in fact, took humans and trained them how to hunt deer, and hunt animals like that. But anyway, he he kills the serpent, and the underwater creatures flood the earth, and this is representative of the pine when how he how he disguised himself, and also how he used earth brought up from the bottom of the flood by muskrat on the back of a turtle while singing part of the creation song to recreate the earth everybody lives on. The story itself is a very good one for our, our youth and, and others because it explains why revenge is hard and bad, and it also allows to show why sacrifice sometimes is as important as anything else, because turtle accepted the dirt on its back, knowing it could never get off from under it, that all the land would always be on the back of Mashika. And having done so, was greatly aware that that sacrifice was being made and in fact, mentions that they will sacrifice, he would, Turtle would sacrifice for the good of all the other people. 
And that's our first example of how we're supposed to live our lives as Native American or as Anishinaabe. We also have a story, although some of the bands disagree with it, of how we got to the Great Lakes. This is from the Mishumas book, written by a person I know a little bit, Eddie Benton Benet. And it says that we were originated along this coastline, right in the main New Brunswick, New Hampshire area. And due to both prophecy and probably running into Vikings or other early individuals, thought it might be better to move inland. And the, the story is that they moved to where there was a turtle that never moved past the thundering waters into an area where they found the meagest shell and where food grew on the water. The migration on here shows that it was down the, or up the St. Lawrence River into the Great Lakes and they moved all the way out. In fact, our Anishinaabe tribes of Chippewa, Turtle Mountain Chippewa, who are in Montana. They're Anishinaabe people in Canada, north of them, all the way across to the Hudson Bay. It's one of the largest areas of habitation for tribes in history. The migration is said to have taken 500 years. Now, it is also said to have been following the routes that they had used for as auto during their periods of time trading. And this island right here, Manitoulin, where our language instructor here at the tribe comes from, says that they know the migration came, they were there right. into it and then moved further along. I used to joke with them that the problem was they didn't leave to go with us. So I don't know what, what was wrong, but that seemed to be the, the course of events. When it came to being traders, the Ottawa were very good at it. What were you doing? I was talking. <laughs> when it comes to event to the trading, Ottawa's were really good at it. And this is from our book, Our People, Our Journey. This shows how they traded. They, some of the trade routes on here are, are indicative of what happened. Like this one through the Lake Superior. They also would come down to their villages or in, from their villages, whoops, back, nope, you're wrong way. Back and actually sail straight across the lake. They wouldn't have to sail along the shorelines all the time. They sailed along the shorelines because they were going from village to village, but sometimes they went, as it shows in Lake Superior, they just went straight across the lake. These are various trade routes at various times. And I think you should, they would be very intrigued to know that that set And that's the, the trade route set up a whole system where the Ottawa and <clears throat> to our east, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, as they're sometimes called, were trading furs with the British and the French. And fur was the first thing that became a huge commerce item. I, I didn't realize felt was that important to Europeans at that time. But it got to the point where the Haudenosaunee were given rifles, not rifles, but muskets by the British so that they could expand the trade area. And they actually pushed the Anishinaabe all the way across the Great Lakes until the Anishinaabe's trade partner, the French, decided that they needed to return the favor and give the Anishinaabe firearms. And at a point here known as Iroquois Point in the UP, the advance was stopped and everything was pushed back to where it had started and they returned to their normal positions. But the trade partners always seemed to be at each other's throat during this time. And the tribal folks tended to har over harvest to get more trade goods, depending on how much it cost. Now I'm gonna say, here's, here's, mm -hmm. 
Here's how they actually made the trades. This is an example of the of the Jijiman, the big boat, the big canoe, the ones that were used for trading. They were between 35 and 45 foot long. They're approximately four and sometimes four and a half feet wide in the wide part from about here through here. They're made of birch bark <clears throat> and other material. And examples of them today will carry about six tons of material without sinking or having distress in their sailing method. This picture is called, uh, we dine in a cottonwood tree and it shows several canoes and a trading group. And you can see inside the ca canoes are barrels and other items they traded for. I would like to show you what the canoes are like. This is from our cultural corridor. This is a smaller canoe. This would be like a river canoe. In fact, it's almost like a personal canoe because it was made by <clears throat> a youth group here. We have three or four of them around that were. And I was going to explain by going back and forth that along the black line is a seam in the birch bark. On the seam, they would take pine sap heat it up a little bit and stir ashes into it and run it through there. And when it dried, it would seal the bark to make sure that where it had been sewn together or attached, it didn't leak. If you got really sharp eyes or expand your screen a lot, right along this edge underneath the, the gunnel, gunwale, you can see the white part of the birch bark, which is inside the canoe. That's because the brown part here is much smoother. And they figured out that if it's smoother, it goes through the water better than if it were white, with the white bark that has the things, usually knots and, and things sticking out of it. The inside of the canoe, once you had enough birch bark laid out and, and treated, you would create these uh, ribs out of some kind of ash tree usually. And you would actually put them on the ground and bend them and while they're green and wet and stake them so they held that position. And that's how you got the frame to be what it was. You would then take more black ash or similar softwood that you could strip into strips and lay it in here on the bark so that it made a an inner hole that this rested on and then it was all tied to the to the frame that you had up here with the support crosses which weren't necessarily seats and once you got all done it was a very useful item because it was lightweight even the larger ones could be carried by four or six guys if they were empty. And once they were full, they could be slid up on a beach or on a, an area for unloading that worked really, really well. The other secret is this little hole right here. This hole was for a single mast that held a sail that was across and the guy in the back would steer hopefully directed by the guys in front because he couldn't see anything past the sail. And that's how they would cross the lake or make long trips. Once we got to this area, the Anishinaabek settled and these are villages in the Hinsdale Atlas. The Hinsdale Atlas was written by William Hinsdale and it's an atlas of archeological sites. There are very few of them intact and out there, the tribe has two. One was given to the Historic Preservation Department and one was given to the Tribal Council. So we're lucky to have two copies of the Hinsdale Atlas. This copy of the of the villages, as you look at it, I'll see if I can move it up and move it over. Uh, move in here, there we go has different colors for the 
villages. There's green, there's some purple ones in the south, and the orange ones here, and there's some green ones in the UP. That's because he put the villages in there and then listed the language the village had. So the orange ones are the ones he listed as an Ottawa language. The green ones, Chippewa language, and the purple ones were Potawatomi. The Wyandot, Huron, and others that are in the area at the same time were in this part of the country and they're a little different color. When I talk to the students and others about it, I always like to bring up this area right in the middle here, where the little hand's at right now. I bring that up because it says the language is unidentified. They don't know what language that is. And I don't know if you can read what it says, but I'll, I can spell it for you. It's S-H-I-T-U-M-O-R-O-N-S. When they were asked the name of that place, somebody told them Chitou Morons or something similar. And they wrote it down. So literally in the Atlas of Historic Villages, there's one right here nobody knows the language of that is shit you morons. Now, I know how that happens. When you ask Native Americans questions, you have to be careful because sometimes they'll give you an answer they think is funny. Even if it's not funny at that, that moment, they know that it's going to be funny later. My example for this, and I, and I always tell people, I blame my own relatives for that, because they were all that way. They all told jokes of, of that type, so much so that Manistee, when it got its prison, I worked for the Chamber of Commerce. I was the chief of staff, which they thought was funny, because I was also the chairperson for the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians Incorporated before we were reaffirmed. And we were talking about the Manistee prison, and everybody was arguing over what the name should be. And the Department of Corrections guys were there and they said, <clears throat> well, we've already asked. And they said, we can't call it the East Lake prison. East Lake Village said no. Manistee County said not to call it the Manistee prison. The city of Manistee said you can't call it the Manistee prison. So in all earnesty, one of the guys turned to me and said, hey, how do Native Americans say prison? And I sat there a minute thinking, because we didn't have any. Nobody ever got locked up. Didn't have a lock on your door. So I told them, observation. And he said, could you say that again? I said, sure, observation. He said, could you spell that? And I said, R-E-S-E-R. V-A-T-I-O-N. He says, that's, that, that's reservation. That doesn't mean prison. And I told him, depends on which side of the line you're on. He didn't get that quite as well as I thought he would, but at least I know why that could be called that. These villages are also the main villages. There were several little small villages that were in the in Michigan at the same time. Oh, and my family, I put my glasses on so I can see the map real good. My family comes from this area of Michigan, down in here, which is no, known as Fort Village, which will show up a, a little later. Oh, and over here, we have a village right here. You see the word Kowakishkum. Come, I'll come back to him later too, because he has a very colorful moment in his life. Oh, there we go. Here are some other villages. This is from our, of the Grand River Bands. We, we the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians, are nine of the Gima, Ogimuk, Ogima folks who ruled, had villages. They have villages in the south, and then they would winter in the north. And I thought about that for a minute and said, Wait, wait, we lived in the south in the summer. Then we would move north in the winter. That, that, that doesn't seem like a good idea. 
But what it was, was in the south, we had long houses and that's where the garden plots were because the rivers were a little bigger, the, the flood plains were different. Um, the M231 project <clears throat> crossing the Grand River near Spoonville discovered one of those sites where they had villages and cash pits and showed that that had actually been in use from BC through modern Anishinaabek time, the same cash pits with the same stuff in it. But anyway, we would farm down here and guys would go out and, and trade. And then in the winter, we'd go up the coast in the larger canoes and into the little areas <clears throat> like the Manistee River where you could live on a bio area where Indian villages in Brown Township, Manistee County and trap. And the trapping was done there because it were, there wasn't as easy a place to trap in the South. And the villages would break up. The, the longhouse villages would have multiple families and multiple longhouses and move up North to smaller villages of uh, wigwam bark houses, dome houses, and maybe just one family in a, in a lodge rather than the garden house variety. This in fact is what would happen today. This is where, what, where you'd be today if you were a traditional Native American back just around contact period. <clears throat> this is a camp set up where the maple sugar trees are, the sugar maple trees. And what they're doing is tapping trees and boiling the sap down to make maple sugar and maple syrup, which the word for our, our word for maple syrup is basically sugar water, sugar liquid. The story behind it that I was told is that at one point, all you had to do was put a tap in a maple tree, tap a maple tree by cutting the bark into a V and catching, having it come out a little bit and catching the sap. And the sap was automatically syrup. You could use it right out of the tree. And you can also do that with birch trees. A lot of people didn't realize that there's birch syrup you can get too. A couple others, but I forget what they are. And what started happening was the Anishinaabek would tap a tree, get the sap they wanted for whatever meal they're preparing and just walk away. They wouldn't reseal the tree up with the pine mixture like you use on a canoe. They would untap the tree if they had used some kind of tap other than just the V method and sap would run out on the ground. And Nanabuju, who taught us a lot of stuff and is a, a hero and a clown and a teacher and a bad example all at the same time, went to the creator and said, look what they're doing with this. They have this wonderful gift and yet they're just letting it waste. And so the creator said, I can fix that. The creator added water to the sap. That's why you have to boil it today. And you have to boil it so that a lot of sap makes a little syrup. I forget the exact ratio, it's pretty close to eight or 10 to one at a minimum. It could even be higher, probably maybe 15 gallons to a gallon of syrup when you're done. And the reason that made it more valuable is of course here, this is after contact. I said around or around contact because they have metal pots. They still had to make this syrup and they still made syrup and made candy out of the maple. Because if you just keep cooking it down and then put it on little cones of bark or in cones, it'll set up and become sugar and you can eat it like candy. And all the well-behaved children got maple candy every once in a while as a treat. I myself didn't have a whole lot of it. I don't know what that means, but. Jay, I have a question for you. you. Sure. 
Um, Andrea would like to know what the buckets were made from. Okay, the buckets here are metal because they're trade buckets. What I was going to point out is when the pre-contact, once they had to start boiling it down from there, they would catch it in a birch bark or similar, what we call a macaque, like a, a, a basket looking thing, but it, it's actually watertight. That's how you would haul water around and, and the sap. And then they would take it over and if they had it built, they might have a tray made out of pottery that you could set by the fire and put the stuff in and boil it out. Otherwise, you would have to put it in the same thing you made your soup in. Basically, a leather bag or an animal's uh, stomach bag that had been sewn up. And you would heat rocks up on the fire and put them in the bag until you brought it to a boil, putting them in, taking them out, and rotating them. So that it could also take a lot of, it took a lot of work to boil this down until, well, now that we have metal containers and things, it's a lot easier. But yeah, the originals would be a birch bark or really tight wove uh, black ash basket type device to catch the sap and carry it over. And then it was dumped into whatever you were going to use to boil it out. That's a very good question. I appreciate it. Oh, and this shows the uh, bark house, the wigwam. That's what these are. In the wintertime, that's what you would live in. And that's because a lot of people think today, a lot of tribal folks think, well, they must have burned all this oak that is around here. And I remind them that if they, <clears throat> if they're thinking about pre-contact, sawing an oak tree down with the jawbone of a moose is kind of a long-term process. I mean, it's, it's a proposition that will take you and probably your grandkids to finish cutting that tree up. And that would, because as we repatriate things from museums that have ha had discoveries or brought to them and stuff, we find that the saw was indeed the jawbone of an animal with the teeth still in it, with a handle put on it so you could move it back and forth. Well, that's fine for sawing small cedar and pine and things like that. It's not so good for sawing on hardwoods. Here's the deal. And this one's got lots of those folks up. 1821 Treaty of Chicago. Okay, that's this green spot down here at the bottom on the west side, it's the Treaty of Chicago. The Treaty of Chicago was being negotiated. They knew there was going to be a treaty coming for the Anishinaabeg, the Ottawa, and the Chippewa of the Treaty of Washington area. So they asked someone to go down and see what's, what's this all about, what happens. The person who led the delegation was named Kowakishkum. I mentioned his village earlier. He went down just to see what was going on. How they talked, what kind of meetings they had. And while he was there, he noticed that all these folks would get what he thought were presents, gifts, giveaway stuff. And he asked, well, how can a person get these gifts? What, I don't understand how you would have gifts for some people and not for everybody. That's not a, a traditional thing. And he was told, well, if you take a feather and you touch this leaf or this paper, take your Megwan, touch Mazinigan, the paper, we'll give you the presents to take back. And they asked him who he was and where he was from, and they put it on the, the document. And inadvertently, Kuwakerskum seated the holdings that make up the panhandle up part in the Treaty of Chicago. Mostly the villages on the Thornapple River that were allies or related to the folks in the Grand River. When he got back, as it says, when he came back, they asked him what happened. And he told him. And so he was banished from council. My 
uncles used to take me aside and say, Quaker scum was banished from council because his friends told him, come on, we're going fishing. We'll go upstream and do some fishing. And when he got in the canoe, he said, hey, what are all these clubs? And he just didn't come back from the fishing trip. That's not the Quaker scum who led the Manistee village. It's the one who led the Grand River village on the Thornapple River, who overextended his authority and so got in trouble. Once that treaty the, was negotiated, the Treaty of Saginaw already existed. Then the Treaty of Washington was negotiated. The Treaty of Washington is a, a document that covers the area you see there in red. And I'll go into detail other than what's on here about it in a minute. Treaty of Washington, I guess I can start now. The Treaty of Washington was negotiated because the Ottawa and the Chippewa in that area realized that most of the other tribes, including some of the Potawatomi, had been relocated, just like the Cherokee, just like the Lenape, who are relatives because they use the same language. That the Haudenosaunee, once the, one of the larger competitors in the region, were almost a shadow of their own size and um, abilities. That other tribes, smaller ones, the Sock, the Fox, the Illini, um, the Illini Federation or Conference, the Illini, the folks from Indiana, all the tribes in Indiana were gone. So in order to not be one of the tribes that had to be gone, they decided they would actually negotiate this, although they did say they didn't wish to do so over and over. What the federal government did, which was kind of clever, is they took them to DC, all the tribal leaders, so they wouldn't have their people around to, to bolster their demands and to, <clears throat> give them support. While they were in DC, they negotiated what, when you read it on its face, is a very good for the tribe and for Michigan or the federal government treaty. They ceded all the terrain outlined in red, except they kept the reservations you see out marked in the little yellow dots. You see them better on the rice map in a minute. I think that's the next thing. They kept those. They kept the right to use the ceded territory for hunting and gathering and other rights that, as though they still lived on it until it was needed for settlement. That caused all kinds of the heartache over the hunting and fishing rights was what does that phrase mean? Required for settlement. And the treaty was set with no time limits on it. It was approved. Um, Schoolcraft and others for the president signed it, was sent as was necessary in the federal government system or US system to Congress and the Senate changed it. The Senate changed the length of time the reservations would be there. They limited them to five years unless the president allows the people to stay longer. They changed all some of the um, agreed upon payments were to be made. And they just sent it back and said, there you go. Now you're good. Well, the people came back, the, the people with the treaty as it had been amended came back and the original treaty signed by approximately 30 folks from the Grand River. Maybe it's only 20 from the Grand River and 10 from Sault Ste. Marie and Bain, the, those areas. Anyway, the, the amended version is signed by less than half of the original signatures. And none of the people in the amended version are the same people that were in the original version. But it was ratified March 28th, 1836, which is for the tribe now, Treaty Recognition Day. 
if anybody wants to ask, yes, I can explain why it's called Treaty Recognition Day. It's called Treaty Recognition Day because we think somebody should recognize the treaties. We know the feds don't like to do it, but at least now we have a holiday that comes up at that time of the month, the 28th of March, <clears throat> which makes my son, my younger son, kind of big headed because that's his birthday. And he tells people that the March 28th holiday is because of him, not because it's Treaty Recognition Day. Which Jay, goes, um, I'm sorry. Go um, Nancy was asking, was the green area from the Treaty of Chicago? Yes. Okay. That's in the bottom. I can move my cursor down here, maybe if I can find it. And we've got about five more minutes and then we'll go to question and answer. I've got a couple of questions built up here on the chat okay. room. Let me, this is, this is why the Treaty of 1836 looks so weird when you read it, because the Grand Traverse Band Reservation is on the North Shore of Grand Traverse Bay. That's because this map from 1822, a version that had been drawn by a person named Beaupere, who was the best map maker in Europe, is what they were using when they looked at it. That's what the state of Michigan was drawn as. Beaupere was the best map maker in Europe. I looked him up. He never left his neighborhood. He only took notes from everybody else and drew the maps. So their, their reservation, if you quickly look for the North Shore following straight up from Grand Traverse Bay, their reservation would be in the UP. <laughs> That's the next shoreline you go to sailing due north. The one by Manistee, this is, this is the Royce map. Royce was a person who laid out all the treaties, mapped all the states where the treaties were and explained how they're like, what the actual on the ground look for them is. He points out that the reservations are in there and that they're used where a treaty was signed and there wasn't an actual reservation there's none listed for that treaty. This is the Manistee Reserve. It was supposed to be on the River Pierre Marquette. Unfortunately, there was no River Pierre Marquette because nobody had heard of it. So nobody knew where it was. The one that's now the Pierre Marquette, when they asked the locals what its name was, they called it Nindibaketong ZB, the place of Skulls River. When they asked this area what the name of the river was, they were told Namanitagong ZB, the land under the trees river, because that's what they called the area. And finally, Schoolcraft decided to put it here and named the area Manistee, which he says meant whispering spirit in the woods or something along that lines. This is a company K photograph. Company K was there because after the 36 treaty and the 55 treaty, which had a huge disaster in it, the 1855 Treaty of Detroit, which doesn't have a whole lot of map value because there was no land exchanged. In the 1855 Treaty of Detroit, the Ottawas and Chippewas asked that they dissolve the Ottawa Chippewa tribe of Michigan. It is at this point that the Little River Band folks and the Grand River folks run into their first problem because they agreed to put that in there. And somehow it made the Ottawa disappear. Not necessarily the Chippewa, but the Ottawa all seemed to disappear. And in our Reaffirmation Act, they do say it was an inadvertent administrative failing that left us off the nation to nation list. The reason I have these guys on here is in the Civil War with the promise of a new treaty to be negotiated or to treaties to be repaired. Company K was formed. They're all Anishinaabek, 120 Anishinaabek individuals fighting the Civil War on, a half of, on behalf of the Union. The first Michigan sharpshooters, Company K. It says the eagle in the crater. They had an eagle that flew over them when they were in battle, if they were going to, when they released it. They fought in several combats, including Petersburg, where they charged into the crater 
after they blew the huge crater in the earthworks of the Confederacy, these guys went in. All 120 of them went in, about 20 got out because the stuff they were carrying to climb back out was too short. And the troops that were supposed to go with them had cannons and body parts and things landing on them a half mile away after the bomb went off. And so it didn't start on time and then got suspended. And so these guys got all shot up. We were in Petersburg and the guy running the thing showed me a Petersburg National Battlefield, showed me a letter from a general in the Confederacy complaining about the Native American troops, the Company K troops, because they would get their uniforms when they had them all dirty, so they didn't shine and weren't easy to see. They would also tie grass or sticks or whatever was around them to their uniform. So they could, as he put it, they lay on the ground, we walk by, they shoot at both our skirmishers and the line and they lay back down and we end up shooting at each other because we can't see those damned Indians unless you step on one. I said, they were very adept evidently at camouflage. They were very good shots too, because to be a sharpshooter, you would shoot your Civil War musket at a hundred yards and they would measure between where you hit in the bullseye. And if the measurement came up to less than five inches between each shot, you were a sharpshooter. If it didn't, you were just a soldier. Every one of these guys met that criteria. In fact, that's the other thing the general was asked why he didn't just sweep them aside. He said, because every time one of their men leaned over to shoot into the hole, they got shot in the head or shot in the upper body. So they had to wait till the Indians in the hole had lost all their ammunition, at which time they started singing their song, and the death song, and just waited to be killed or captured. The end of their Petersburg story is their company flag is the one that was put up in the Petersburg town hall to prevent the gunboats in the river from firing, indicating that the city had been surrendered. Here are some acts that are important to the tribe. Citizenship Act. Mostly the Citizenship Act were to make Indian citizens because they weren't. It also allowed courts to declare them incompetent and take possessions if they happen to be living on a gold mine or something. The Reorganization Act, 1934. Very important because you could reorganize your reservation, you could be recognized and they would give you a constitution or you could have your own constitution. We actually reorganized under that in our Reaffirmation Act. We tried to reorganize in 18, 1935, but they told us we didn't have a reservation. We told them that wasn't our fault because they set the reservation up. We didn't get rid of it, they did. They said, well, yeah, you're, you're nice enough folks, but you don't have a reservation. We said, you, you could set up the reservation and they weren't interested in that. So in 35, after the 55 got us disbanded or dissolved, we kept fighting with the federal government from 1856 through 1935, 48, 73, on into 94 to get re recognized. And these are just acts that have impacted tribes all along, the Termination Act, all these tribes you see here were 109 of them were declared non-existent by an act of Congress. The Menominee tribe had a person named Ada Deer who went through the federal court system to establish that as a treaty signing entity, Congress, even though they have exemplary power and what they call uh, plenary power, don't have the power to disband the tribe because of the treaty. She won. The Menominee were re recognized as were many of these areas like Turtle Mountain, most of the California tribes. Public Law 280 came along because they said, we need to make sure that the states 
and their laws cover the reservations of the Indians. That way we can lower their ability to rule themselves. Several states said, okay, Michigan said, no, we don't, we don't need to, we don't have that many tribes. Because I think they only had two at the time, maybe three. So otherwise we would be a 280 state, but Michigan is not. So all the tribes in Michigan have a sovereignty level almost, almost functionally equal to the state of Michigan when it comes to the federal government. Then there were some reverses that came along. And as it says here, John, John Kennedy was against it. Lyndon B. Johnson was against it. But Richard Nixon got the Indian Self-Determination Education Act, 638 Act, passed in 73. You'll note on there that most existing federal funding for tribes comes under that act. Then there's the Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1977. From 1890 at the ghost dance issue, until this act in 1977, it was against federal law for any two people to gather and practice Native American religions anywhere in the United States. The interesting part of that law that made it illegal was you didn't have to have federal officers or the sheriff or the state police catch you. You could be turned over by a pastor or anyone in good standing. And so until 77, most of our religious practices became disguised as something else. The example I use with our family is we have our ghost supper where we celebrate the ancestors and have a feast and everybody's invited. They can come and go if they want. We have our ghost supper on All Saints Day because while we're having this traditional ceremony, if somebody shows up that we are not sure who they are or they happen to be a clergy member, we just tell them, like all good Catholics, we're having All Saints dinner. And then we go to the folks who were Catholic and say, quick, genuflex, we all remember how to do that. Because some of us, you know, some of us do it with the wrong hand or go the wrong direction. I don't know of anybody who was completely arrested for violating the religious, before the Religious Freedom Act, but I do know they broke up several meetings of other tribes and even lodges here. Then there's the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978. Children from tribes could be adopted out without the parents having any necessarily rights to contest. Um, I have a cousin who was adopted out because their household didn't have any milk or bread. And the reason for that is, of course, Native Americans are lactose intolerant because we didn't have milk. And they made their own bread every day. That way they didn't have to go to, they, could, cause they couldn't go to the store. Some of them didn't have any real work or anything. <clears throat> the Indian Child Welfare Act said that if you're going to put a child who's eligible for enrollment in a tribe up for adoption, the tribe can come in and have some say in the process. It can't just happen. And it did just happen a lot. So much so that I mentioned earlier to Barbara that, to Barb, that there were advertisements. If you want to adopt a child, we can get you a Native American or an Indian child for $10. Because they knew they'd just go in the home, take the kid out, go do the adoption, ta-da, over. In fact, when we were living in California, right after I was born, we were living in California and we were going back and forth on 66. We went twice a year to Michigan. One of those trips, we stopped in a diner. And my mom, who's a nice uh, Gaelic sort of person, about five foot two, had me sitting next to her. And these two Navajo women came up and started asking her where she got the baby. And they weren't gonna let her leave until my father stepped up and told them that I was his son. And they talked to him a minute and found out that he was Ottawa and 
I thus was Ottawa and uh, he was married to this woman who probably has some uh, Wakamakong family ties, but can't necessarily prove it due to adoption issues and closed adoptions. But they were not gonna let, let this woman take this child because they were afraid it was somebody who had been sold as that $5, $10 offer deal. And they wanted to save the child and bring them back to their own people. Then of course the Seminole opened a high stakes bingo in 79 and the gaming issues in the era had begun. Our reaffirmation act is public law 103.324 as amended. They say that all the time if you're talking in legalese. It was signed in September 21, 1994 by William Jefferson Clinton. We have a soft spot in our heart for William Jefferson Clinton. He also sent us a peace medal showing that we have peace and, and uh, friendship with the United States. It's a copy, an exact copy of the Jefferson Peace Medal, the Thomas Jefferson Peace Medal that he sent out. And I have it under lock and key when we're not displaying it for the brief moments because it can't be replaced. The act it says is to reaffirm and clarify the federal relationship with the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Ottawa, Ottawa Indians. There's one spelling, and the Little River Band of Ottawa Indians. We're, we're both the same group, same people. We, we just def, defer on how to spell the word Ottawa. Others have spelled it A-D-A-W-E. So it's, it's one of those things that, given that our language was not written in anything but maybe pictures at, at best a long time ago, we know how to say the word, we just don't know how to spell it. And if you mispronounce it a little bit, then that's how you spell it. The law was passed by Congress and it has in it almost an apology that says we were administratively removed us to the Treaty of 1855 from nation to nation status and that we had actually had that relationship and it's reaffirmed that status and that as a nation, we predate the United States of America. That's kind of an important thing to have in a law. It, it makes, makes it so Congress has recognized that we are an older nation than the United States. And we kind of like that thought. These are some of the things we do today. This is our sturgeon rearing facility on the Manistee River. Those are little sturgeon. We catch the eggs and the fry and we raise them to a given size. And when they're safe, we put them back in the river and so ceremony that usually goes on in the late summer, early fall. We of course built a little river casino resort. That's it under construction because I don't really have any pictures of it finished for some reason. We built a gas station. We have the new government center. We have uh, all of that kind of thing set up. And that's how we got here more or less, that's who we are. We have had our trials and tribulations, but we're moving forward. We're trying to be good neighbors and good um, community members in that we give money from our casino to local governments. We give it to the state government. We also make charitable do donations. We've donated approximately I want to say $22 million to local charities since we opened the casino in 1999. That's a smaller version of it. A word about our flag. This is the tribal seal. The middle part has the medicine wheel around it. These nine feathers represent the nine chiefs. This is our name in English. That's our name in the language, except for a mistake. We forgot to pluralize the Anishinaabe. And the colors run out to the edges, which are blue, representing the waters that circle and surround everything and bring life to all things. On here, you can't see it, but in our seal, there are two eagles flying next to what's supposed to be a cedar tree. The artist can't draw a cedar tree, so it always looks like a pine tree when he drew it. And I know that because I was the artist. But we have two eagles up there because if you don't have male and female, you're only ever gonna have one eagle. 
and you're sooner or later going to run out of eagles. And it's the balance that brings us forward. And I thank you for listening. If you have any questions. Well, Jay, I can't tell you the, the feedback I'm getting um, through the chat is amazing. Um, I've been asked by two different people if we can bring back um, you for another presentation. So we would love that. I'm going to ask a couple questions that people had. Um, if I asked this correctly, Mary wanted to know about the bark houses. Some were shaped like uh, round mounds and then the teepees were the triangular on the poles. Yes. Is that correct? The bark houses were round and... Yes, we actually had the, the conical or teepee shaped houses, usually for travel. They would be to, you'd take the bark with you and you would lay it on there. Sometimes instead of bark too, you used uh, mats and things made from cattail stems and leaves that would get pounded into the fibers and then wove into cloth like substance. And they would be used for it too because it was a light, easy to carry product. But yeah, we had the teepee shaped, we had the dome shaped wigwam, wigwaswam, uh, birch bark home or bark home. And as I said, along the Grand River, we had longhouses similar to what you see with the Haudenosaunee, which were called the garden houses. The garden houses would hold maybe four families, sometimes six, depending on the size. There'd be two or three of them in the village. Then as the village moved to the smaller vi villages or the winter villages, there'd be three or four lodges and that would be three or four families. So, but yeah, we and, use the triangular one to move or the cone shaped one. And then Andrea wanted to know in general, what did the treaties that you were discussing, what did they give and take from the um, Native people. <clears throat> well, the treaties, almost every treaty, except for the 1855 treaty, which took a, us out of existence for a while, <laughs> the treaties of 1836 and 1821, and the treaty with the Saginaw Chippewa of 1819, I think it is, all had land sessions to them. Great big tracts of land or tracts of land that they thought those folks controlled were given to the federal government as part of the deal with our hunting and fishing rights that we still have today under treaty and the reservations that were supposed to be still be around as the trade-off. You can have all this land, we'll use parts of it that nobody lives on and we'll fish where we always fished and we'll live on these reservations in these areas, because that way we can still practice our own religions and whatever. The 1836 treaty, in case it escapes people's notice, uh, the treaty of 1830, March of 1836 was ratified. The land was given to the federal government. They immediately transferred it to the state of Michigan which wasn't the state of Michigan, it was the territory of Michigan. And then declared that Michigan had enough territory to to become a state. So in 1837, Michigan becomes a state. That's, that's what that particular treaty trading out was. We, like I said, we still have the hunting and fishing and use the factory rights, which I don't think we use that much, but to hunt and fish and gather. And we don't, the modern version of that is we don't pay for camping in federal campgrounds or on federal land that's forestry land or park service land oh. and we can hunt on our own land or on land that is set aside as not used for living <laughs> we're renegotiating the exact deal even this year and because the court negotiated agreement ends next year and we want it, both the state, the feds and us want to get ahead of the, we don't want it to just end and start over because right. that tends to be messy. And then a, a good, and this is a, a question that I just love being a um, semi-farmer. Do you have a heritage seed program? We do not. 
Gun Lake, um, Saginaw Chippewa, I think Pokagon, and maybe Little Traverse currently are involved in a heritage with a heritage seed program. Okay. The University of Michigan has been very good about their agricultural collection. They treat it the same now as they would all the others. So they re rematriate, not patriate, because they say it's more motherly than fathering, the materials to the tribes from where they were collected. And they haven't run across any that says they were collected from here or along the Grand River specifically yet. Although other tribes are willing once we get to the point where we want to do it to repatriate their seeds, grow the crop, collect some seeds for themselves, collect seeds for others mm -hmm. and share those seeds. So there are people growing your first squash, beans and corn, Lovely. some of the potatoes that we're growing here. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole different, it's a whole different kind of food. You think of corn, you think of corn on the cob like now. The corn we grew was a little harder on the husk, had a harder husk and a little less sugar. So they would boil it till it popped, the top would pop open and the kernel would kind of be there and they make soup out of it and stuff. Or they would grind it up and make cornbread out of it and corn meal, uh, corn mush. And it was highly, it was a lot more nutritious than some of the, like the bicolored sweet corn they have now where they right. grow it to make sugar or grow it to make corn syrup. We didn't have corn syrup because the, you'd have to harvest all the corn to make some. But we did have um, several plants that were grown and several that were just harvested because they were growing in, in a large abundance. One of my favorite areas and one of my favorite folks I talk to is from Gun Lake. And I always give her a hard time about how come when your pawpaws are done, you don't ever let me have any. I said, sure, you gave me some a few years ago, but now, nope. I said, are you guys losing that many pawpaws down there? Because there's a little fruit that's kind of like a star fruit and it's really good. <laughs> I told him, because if you don't want to share star fruit, then we won't share our wild rice on Hamlin Lake. Now, how about that? Here you go. <laughs> but yeah, there's there are tribes that have those and they're doing really well. And like I said, it's a good thing with the University of Michigan Botanical Gardens sharing Thanks. your collection. And they grow, they grow some of it at the botanical gardens. Then they take those and they get to take those home and start their own process there. I love so, that. That was a great question. Um, I do have two more questions, more for um, references afterward. Um, uh, one person wanted to know whether you'd be able to share the reading references for the stories that you've told. If you could maybe share them with me and then I could share them out if you have them. And then um, right. if you are willing to share your slide presentation, there were a couple of people that asked about that too. Sure, that, that's, I, I can do that. That'd I be wonderful. Hopefully so, they memorize the narration part because <laughs> some of the slides don't have a whole lot of writing on. And we will have a recording of your presentation on our website and we'll post it on Facebook as well. So for those folks who would like the slideshow, if you could email info at benzymuseum.org, info at benzymuseum.org, Mariah will send those out to you when we get them. And then any reading references you have as well. Okay. But this was, I mean, the feedback, I, the, your, the chat has gone on and um, I'll share that with you so you can see some of the comments. But thank you so much. We do really, we want to have you back. Um, so well, talk I'd be about happy to come back and, and we can even talk about specific topics or some of them you and I discussed in our half hour, hour, hour and 15 minute long discussion. <laughs> it was a great discussion. And yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have you back. And we're also open to having a program if you ever would like to welcome, um, you know, when things kind of open up with COVID if you'd like to have a program um, and welcome the Historical Society friends, we would really like the opportunity to visit you. 
Sure, we can do that. You can, we'll go over and visit the uh, cultural corridor and the casino and the small museum we have just outside my office here. That would be wonderful. All right, there's, thank you. There's some stories on the gathering grounds and be all set. All right, we'll connect then the next few days. Okay. Thank you, Jay. It's been wonderful to meet you. It was wonderful. I learned so much today in both of our conversations. And she miigwech moab on. That means thank you for spending time with me. I appreciate everybody taking time out to, to share that time with me. Well, we appreciate. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you next month for our lecture. And if you do want to see um, the presentation, um, it will be on our website. And then uh, the reading references and slides as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.